Greetings, I'm Justin Rothshank, and I'm here to invite you to join me and 30 other potters from around the country for the 10th annual Michiana Pottery Tour, happening on September 25 and 26 in northern Indiana and southern Michigan. You'll find a list of participating potters, links to their web stores, and more information at www.michianapotterytour.com or on our Instagram page at Michiana Pottery Tour. We hope to see you at the 10th annual Michiana Pottery Tour. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 386 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, I talk with Stephen Earp. From his studio in Northwest Massachusetts, he makes pots that are in the Redware and Delft traditions. In this interview, we talk about his interest in this era of ceramics and how working at Old Sturbridge Village as a young potter set him on a path of interpreting the past through contemporary pots being made today. If you'd like to see examples of his work, you can do so on his website. That's stephenerp.com. Also have some exciting news. This podcast is now a part of the newly formed Brickyard Podcast Network. The network launched this week and features three new shows, Trade Secret, Clay and Color, and For Flex Sake. If you'd like to find out more about the network, you can do so by going to the website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. Also wanted to take a minute to thank the folks that have been donating to our podcast. We are listener supported, so I'd like to thank John Wathier, Catherine Bloom, and Fiona Wheelband for their recent contributions. If you'd like to get involved yourself, you can do so at the website. That's talesoveredclayrambler.com slash donate. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. So I thought we would start by talking about how you became interested in earthenware specifically, and how that became the medium that you like to use. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I when I first started out in ceramics, I never in my wildest dreams imagined I'd be using electric kilns and making earthenware. I, I went to college uh, in the early 80s, and the big deal was wood-fired ceramics. Um, and that's what I was totally into. <laughs> and it just so happens at that time also, I think there was like this critical mass beginning both in pottery um, programs where people enough people were starting to take get degrees that we had this sense of of pottery and uh, uh, as part of a bigger thing of pottery as an art form uh, to be studied combined with sort of a uh, in education in history in general there was like this reevaluation of getting away from teaching about timeline history of dead white guys for example and moving beyond that and so in the early 80s, rather than get into pottery making, um, you know, through a Euro-American tradition, so to speak, it was all about China and Japan. It was it was all about the Song Dynasty and Japanese wood-fired ceramics, and that's that was me. And I wanted to continue on after college. I got an apprenticeship with a fellow in Central Minnesota named Richard Bresnahan who had studied with um, Nakazato Takashi, I believe his name is a 13 generation Japanese pottery family. And he sort of brought that methodology back. And I wanted to do 
local clays. I wanted to do big Japanese style wood burning kilns. And he gave me all of that. Um, but he also really, his main, the main takeaway from there was he wanted me to really think about my role as a potter, as an artisan in today's society. What was I, how would I combine my skills with my beliefs? What would I do? That was really what he was all about and still is. And uh, right about that time, you know, I know this is kind of a bit of a convoluted, convoluted <laughs> tale, but right about that time, the Iran-Contra scandal hits, wherein the Reagan administration was selling surface-to-air missiles to Iran to raise money to fund the Contra rebels in Nicaragua in the late 1980s, in the 1980s, completely against every law of the United States. And here I was wanting to do something. I heard of an organization called Potters for Peace that had up until then been fundraising for artists, for pottery collectives in Nicaragua. And I said, hey, I'm into wood firing and local materials. I want to go down there. <laughs> and they said, sure, we'll hire you as our first paid technician. And they sort of plot me down in the middle of a civil war in the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, <laughs> which was an eye opener uh, for sure every single day. But the main takeaway really from there, from everyone I interacted with, from the highest levels of the culture ministry down to, you know, barefoot, dirt poor, campesina potters out in the countryside was cultural preservation. Everything from, it's like language, it's like a self-identity, uh, survival in general, but cultural survival, like these potters out in the countryside, this was their income and they're competing now with colorful cheap plastic from China and their daughters see this and they don't want to deal with that and the alternative is for a young uneducated poor girl to go to the big city and you know <laughs> and they wanted to keep this alive anyway so I came back to the United States after all of that that whole time period uh, thinking whatever I do I want it to reflect I wanted to sink some roots finally and I wanted to my pottery to reflect the roots of where I was going to be, you know, geographically, geologically, culturally, historically, I wanted it to be not just about me, but where I was from. And I pretty quickly realized, uh, you know, I know I could talk about Central American pottery, I could talk about Japanese Muromachi era, six ancient kilns pottery, I could talk about West African pottery, I studied a lot of West African art history in college, but I knew absolutely nothing about the pottery of my own backyard. Uh, and it's just my dumb luck that we ended up, I met my wife down in Central America and she's from Central Massachusetts. We ended up back right down the road from uh, one of the largest and oldest open air living history museums in the US called Old Sturbridge Village, where they had a pottery shop uh, interpreting the life and times of Hervey Brooks, partly of the museum's mission was Hervey Brooks, this potter from Goshen, Connecticut, throughout most of the 19th century. And so there was earthenware, there was electric kilns, and there I was. That's kind of how I ended up in that path. And you said something before that you wanted your skills and your ideology to match. And I think that that's interesting when we think about interpretation, like living history museums, and how they are a direct interpretation in front of the visitor, you know, because a lot of these places people are making, or in this case, in Sturbridge um, Village, people are making pots in front of you, like you are actually seeing what is thought to be what the daily life of a potter would be like. Can you talk more about that? The building itself, I mean, that village, how that came to be was some collector, some family was going around in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and they were buying buildings, not just artifacts, but buildings from around New England to preserve that were otherwise rot and fall apart. And they brought them all to Sturbridge and created this village. And one of the buildings they bought was the actual pottery shop of Hervey Brooks uh, from Goshen, Connecticut. And they rebuilt or they built a treadle wheel based on the model, an existing model of a wheel that he used. So you're sitting in the guy's actual pottery shop and you were making pots on a treadle, meal, on a treadle wheel uh, for the public. I, I only did that for about two or three months. And then I ended up, uh, 
underneath, if you've ever been to Old Sturbridge Village, underneath the building, there's an entire modern, funky, really funky, but modern pottery studio. And I ended up moving down there and working with uh, curatorial department and the uh, merchandising department, making special orders, making, you know, making pots for the museum and for educational purposes, whatever, beyond just uh, in front of the public. But yeah, you see, you get this feeling when you're doing that, that it's not just the form that you're working on here. You're not just making a form. You're, you're experiencing where and how this thing sort of was really taking root. And there's just something about that that I found at the time that I, I just soaked it completely up. This checked all the boxes for me. This was pottery history of Massachusetts. This was the forms, this was the history behind it. And I got to work on this. I did periodically go up and work in front of the public when I felt like it. Most of the time I was downstairs on an electric wheel, but uh, it, it was just, it was perfect in that sense for what I was looking for. Can you talk about how storytelling in, in, in the public, but also the pots, is an important part of conveying and protecting history? Because I, I do think that the pots that you make, they are telling a story from the decoration. Sometimes you're using text, which actually has you know some visual cues that there's a story happening. But there's a larger story of that this history is important, that you're making objects that can convey that. So can you talk more about that in a broader sense? Yeah, that's really true. I, in fact, one of the things I do, I've been doing for quite some time is I, I collect sayings, <laughs> you know, from, and it might not be just the 19th century New England. It could be, you know, 1400s Italy or, or France or the Netherlands or whatever. These, using this language, this, you know, the syntax that just isn't, really common today, but really kind of expresses something that I, I think is timely. So I do collect that and, and incorporate that sometimes in the work. But in general, I mean, I've always been into stories, like, you know, just a good story. I like a good story. And with pottery, I feel like I like to know the history of my, my biological family. I like to know our history. And I also equally like to know the history of of my craft and I see that as sort of an extended family. This is this is our story as potters. And I dive down deep into that. And in doing so, I don't know if it is reflected in the pots themselves, but I it's really helped me to understand some of the things that I look at and read about and study, they might not be anything that I'm interested in aesthetically. But if you just look at pots from the past and think, I like that, I don't like that, without really knowing anything about it, you miss a context that is just super deep and super layered. And the more I learn about not just a specific form or pot or whatever, the more I learn about the story of it, how it came to be, you know, how it, it's sort of like this game of telephone through the, through the ages, how this, what it came from, what it's going to, I have this real sense of movement there and, and how I can take part in that conversation. And for me, that's really what it's all about, taking part in a bigger conversation, something more than just me and my own little ideas. It's, it's really communicating with potters and pottery through time, you know. Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your experience with the orders, like what people would order from the museum, or, or even <laughs> if it wasn't a pre-order, the things that the museum thought were important for you to make to then sell in the shop. How did you guys decide what it was? Like, what dictated what you made? Well, that's really... <laughs> I don't know what it's like in other places, and I'm not even sure what I haven't been back to OSV. I, I worked there for about seven or eight years, and that was a long time ago. But um, we had a set. It's a it's a very strange combination of of being historically accurate to what a specific potter, in this case Hervey Brooks, would make, as well as trying to present a range of work from that particular time period, meaning that first few decades of the 1900s in 
a format that a modern audience would want it. So it was this real strange combination of small, medium, and large of everything. And most of the stuff Hervey didn't make, but we have examples of these, you know, uh, bean pots or whatever, uh, various pitcher forms or whatever. He mostly made milk pans and chamber pots, you know, and storage crocks uh, with a few baked dishes and other things. Um, and there'd be a real lively conversation about um, period correctness, so to speak, where, you know, like I am I was working away there and I wanted to start doing things like, let's do some uh, slip work, like feathering and marbling and let's do stoneware and let's do face jugs and let's do this, that, and the other thing. And by and large, that was tolerated by my workmates, which was great. But every once in a while, I'd, you know, yeah, every once in a while, I'd hit a wall where it would be like, well, that just wasn't done <laughs> at this place in this time. But other things would be tolerated, like plates that say Merry Christmas on them, for example, which <laughs> they didn't really celebrate Christmas at that time, at least not like that. It really was not. It was a private, personal thing in, that you did in your house. You had a nice meal. You went to church and that was pretty much it. And none of us wanted to make Merry Christmas plates, but I mean, this is really kind of a funny little uh, microcosm of this. None of us wanted to do that. And the only guy that finally agreed to was sort of my supervisor and he's Jewish. So this Jewish guy is writing Merry Christmas plates for Old <laughs> Sturbridge Village interpreting Herbie Brooks who never made such a thing. So it, it's a convoluted, I have no idea how it all ended up, but we had to deal with it. So it was fine. What's well, funny too, because you mentioned chamber pots, it's like the unsung hero of ceramic history is the chamber pot because Absolutely. everyone had them. Yeah, whole layers of occupation are dated through chamber pot styles through the years, especially in colonial areas, but in England, in France, and Germany as well. You know, it, you track every single style redware, stoneware, white salt fired stoneware, Delft everything is pretty much that was one of the most basic necessities of every single household until indoor plumbing and so you had to have these chamber pots whether you had anything else and they get hard use and then they get thrown in the waste pit and that's how you can tell when a site was first occupied and when a site was no longer occupied so chamber pots and smoking pipes as well another really arcane little corner of a ceramic history but chamber pots are a big deal when it comes to archaeology and and understanding a timeline well i can imagine you know the the people that are coming to old sturbridge village that if you tried to sell them a chamber pot like that would not go over <laughs> well you know and the funny thing is is i think when you look at I've, I've, okay so i've looked at a lot of chamber pots and it's a really elegant form if you just look at it as a form and not really you know like okay what's its function here i've seen like for example they have in their collections at osb and other places as well some old examples and they're just extremely well thrown if you just hold one of these things a handmade chamber pot an earthenware chamber pot or a stoneware one they're by and large they're very well made. They're very sturdy pots and very, I, I can't think of another word than elegant for these things. And that just comes from familiarization, from looking at these things over time and studying and reading about them, you know, but I, I do appreciate that. So looking back on that experience, you know, you're, you're decades from that experience of working in a, a living history museum or, or around one. How do you think that experience would be valuable for a college clay student today? Like, would you recommend that for someone who is interested in being a potter? Well, I, it's not for everybody. Um, but on the other hand, you get paid to make pottery. You get a check every Friday, whether you sell the pots or not. <laughs> you even get health care, you know, from making pots. And uh, for me, I just saw it as a playground in a way. I mean, I, like I mentioned before, this is I was looking for something that could connect me to this, the roots of where I was living. And for me, that worked fine. But I could come in every day and all I did was throw. I could throw 
large, simple forums. I could throw complicated, small forums. I could throw, I could pick a shape and just focus on that for a day or two and just throw, throw, throw. And that was great for skill building. And it was a lot of camaraderie. There are two or three of us down there in that building at the time. And, uh, and on that sense, and then, like I said, you go out and you see the context of what you're making. This is where it all came from. But on the other hand, you really need to give up. You need to be willing to look at the long view here that, you know, you're here for a reason. You're here to serve this, the musicians, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the, the museum's mission. And so as long as you can keep your eyes on the prize and you're just here to learn, you're here to take advantage of this, then that's a good thing. You sort of lose uh, control of how the stuff is uh, used and presented to the public. You're just sitting there making it. And so that can be an issue. Uh, it never really never was for me. You know, I, I like to mention the other thing about the village that I think similar places if someone is interested in this, if someone's just beginning to work on their own and they're interested in history, incorporating history, they had a tremendous, just a phenomenal uh, research library as well. And so I, and they encouraged all their employees to avail themselves of this research library, which made sense. I mean, if you're uh, an educated workforce will only help it with your, with presenting that history to the public. And I pretty quickly realized, you know, if I'm proficient enough to get my work done, I could go over there and spend a few hours reading about pottery and getting paid for it. <laughs> and, you know, where else can you do that? And then I realized the interpretation department had a, uh, a photocopy machine that, that was free and available to everyone. And these are expensive, rare, out of print books. And I could take a book over there and photocopy a chapter a day or whatever. And I've got whole photocopied books <laughs> out of the deal. So it, it worked. It, it, it can be, you can use it to your favor, you know, to your advantage. If you come into it realizing I'm here to learn, you know, and I'm here to really get as much as I, as I can out of this, then it's going to be a really it'll be a very beneficial thing. But if you're thinking, I want to make my own pots, uh, it's not the place for you, I don't think. The pace of creativity in an environment like that is is very different. You know, like I worked in a per similar production studio. We weren't making historically related works. But what would happen is that we would make, you know, 200 of a form, and then we would reevaluate it, which is very different than the way I work in my studio now. Yeah, where, absolutely. You know, I might make 10 of something and then reevaluate. So there's, there's a pace of change that's different. But, but the consistency of making the same form and having the skill be refined, it ties into that whole 10,000 hours concept, you know, like the uh, Malcolm absolutely. Gladwell, you know, would talk about that you have to do some, you just have to do a lot of something to refine that skill. But when you when you left the village and you wanted to go and start on your own, how did you determine what you were going to make those first couple years out of having a solid paycheck, solid job? Yeah, well, well first of all, I, you're absolutely right. You, when you when you just live with a shape over and over and over, regardless of the context, in my case this this museum you understand, you start to learn form and volume in a way that you can't by, like in another context of, okay, everybody make a picture and then, okay, let's talk about what happened. You know, like, look what happened. When you can go back and when you can make that and understand the contours and what it takes to make this thing, that's an education that you can't get in any other way than mass production. And it's not really being an automat, you know, a robot. It's if you look at it as I want to learn this form, this is what you're going to do. You're going to learn the form, you know. Um, but as for when I uh, left the village, the reason I continued making, well, partly I, uh, this was what I was really after. Um, but I also felt like I'm just starting out at the time. And I, I thought, who knows? Nobody knows who I am. Um, but there is a community out there that knows redware, for example. And if I say I make redware, then I'm 
I naively at the time thought automatically tying right into a, a market and audience. And in a way that's kind of true, there is a, there is a community that's really dedicated to this sort of a thing. Although even in the community, there are personalities and people and, you know, who's this guy? I have no idea who this guy is, but it really helped me when I first started thinking of this is a way in to working on my own financially that I can survive is that I can tie into this is it's called a traditional decorative arts market. It's not just pottery, but it's this, it's been going on for decades where it's really encouraged for people to combine their interest in history with their skills, you know, be it pottery or clock making or furniture or whatever. And at first I just wanted to make new England style, rather plain, you know, earth toned pots. And I quickly realized as so many others that have gone before me doing this is that you, you know, a modern audience wants a little more than that. So I started expanding my horizons into Scraffito and slipware and, and points beyond. But that was the whole purpose at the beginning was thinking of this is how I can survive right up front. I need to make money right away. I need to, I need to survive if I'm going to do this. I had a family and, uh, and it tied me into a community that, I've stuck with ever since. As I look at your work now, I think about two, I mean, there are lots of different styles, but there's two kind of broad based things. There's a Malika uh, style, and then there is a um, slipware based style. So can you talk about how you ended up with those two things? Because they're oppositional. Well, they're maybe not oppositional, but they're the skills don't translate exactly. So for instance, slip trailing and brushwork seem similar but they are not similar as skills no. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did you develop this two-part way of working well you know it's like two branches of a family tree in a way they both are earthenware they're both really began on a community level and branched out from there especially the myolica or the deltware yeah and like we were saying i started out with redware plain redware then Scraffito, slipwear, and on and on. And I think it's just a natural thing. You get to a point where you really want to take on some more. <laughs> and uh, through a series of events, I was exposed to, there was a, uh, a museum nearby here, historic Deerfield, put on a three-day seminar on tin glazed pottery that I was able to participate to, to attend. And um, I'm sitting there looking and I thought this, the Maolica, the, the Delft, I thought it's white. So obviously it's a white clay. They have all these different materials and I'm just have the earthenware, the red earthenware. And I'm looking at this, a lot of the original stuff used a red clay with just an opacified glaze over it. And I thought I have all the materials. I could do this. <laughs> I could try this, you know, this, it offered me this whole new world of forms and decorative conventions I had never painted on pottery before, which was a real trip to it, the learning curve was quite long, but um, that's kind of how I got into it. Just starting realizing or just reaching a point where I, 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 I've already said, I, not I haven't, can't really say I've already said I want everything I wanted to say in Redware, but I was feeling like I'm ready for something more here. And that was right there at the right time for that. Yeah, and your brushwork is amazing. Like I can tell how many pots you've made by the <laughs> <laughs> the ability to paint. Like you you mentioned that you had not painted on pots up until this point, and I know as someone who paints on pots, like there are so many bad pots <laughs> to get to the right brush strokes. <laughs> yeah, well, what I tend to say to people that at show or whatever, oh, this is nice stuff, and my first comment is, well, when it works, it's great. You know, as you probably, <laughs> as a Maolica painter, you probably well know as well, when it works, it's great. And it, it and at first it was hard. I mean, you're painting on a porous, dry, porous, unfired glazed surface, and it just soaks up the liquid in that brush. And, and I struggled for quite some time for, a, you know, figuring out, how did they do this? And really a major breakthrough for me came through with um, somebody had mentioned adding glycerin to my stain mix. 
instead of just water, because the water will just instantly soak right into the pot and, and the line is done. You can't go any further with it. And I just started gluck, 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 you know, pouring more and more glycerin into my stains. And now in, in, that, in that way, I can get the lines to flow, you know, and to go to flow. And when it comes to designs or, or whatever covering the surface, um, really there's two, it, it's uh, the way I approach it is, it's just a series of marks. You're just making a series of marks. And the two very most difficult marks that you can possibly make on overglazed pottery like this is a very, very long skinny one, like the banding lines that I do around the outside, for example, of a, of a, of a plate, where you have to have this super fine line. So you need a super fine point on your brush, but you have to have enough material in it to make it all the way around to the end, to the other side of that. To, of that plate and it has to line up once it gets there and that's that's a trick if you can do that that's pretty good it's hard to do to keep enough liquid in the brush to make it all the way across evenly and the other most difficult brush stroke to perform i think anyway is in delft for example there's a lot of teeny little curly cues and so a very fine little curly cue the the bristles in the brush that will chatter or it just won't turn <laughs> it's really hard to do the teeny little things and the big big long ones and the rest of it is just a series of lines that are like half an inch one inch two inch long lines and if you just break it down to mentally to something like that then you can start getting a, a very dense image as a result and are you doing waxing between layers or are you oh, no. doing okay so you're doing all of this at once uh, you know, it's, I'm terrified. I, I went through a long period of before, right now I, I, I'm using a, a white clay underneath it. I started with a red clay, which meant the glaze had to be really, really thick. Uh, I didn't want to have any of the red clay bleeding through because I thought that really interfered with the imagery on the surface. But that also meant there was a whole lot of dry strength issues with the glaze. And also once it was fired, there's a whole lot of crawling and pinholing and sagging and running that you have to contend with and i just thought boy adding anything else like wax or anything to this mix of already dangerous <laughs> <laughs> combinations i just no I, I just had to do it all on the same level and i should add i switched over to a white clay so now i use two different earthenware clays a white clay for the delft and a red for the redware and this is a result, I, a few years back, I was able to go to the Netherlands uh, and I spent 10 glorious days visiting potters and pottery and archaeological digs and museums, meeting with curatorial staff. Um, it was just fantastic. And some tile factories and whatever. And these people were using, today, they're using these white clays, which means you just need a very thin glazed surface over the top. So automatically dry strength is completely improved. It dries much quicker. It handles much easier. The sagging is gone. The blistering is gone. It's, it's a white glaze over a white clay, but it, it just works tons better than you, you, you lose something. I'm sure you know when you put a white glaze over a, a brown clay and you have that warmth coming through underneath. But, but for what I'm doing, it's it, that surface has to be clean and 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 easy to handle <laughs> in order to pull that off. Yeah, and the time commitment for this work, like I, I I know exactly what you mean about switching to a different clay because there's no reason. It's like you could spend a lifetime trying to perfect a tin glaze over red clay, or you I can will just spend a lifetime switch. doing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, can you talk about Delft in in the larger ceramic history context? Because, you know, Malika has many different cultures that passed from the Middle East over to the Netherlands. But why that? And, and can you tell us a little bit about that that history as well? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I call it Delftware, and I've struggled for a long time to figure out what to actually say, how to explain what I make when I say Delftware 
it's not really, it, it means, oh, you're just copying some old stuff. And it's like, well, I'm working in that style, you know, and, and that takes a little bit of explaining sometimes. But if I call it Maiolica, the, the context either is a contemporary Maiolica or historically is more like an Italian thing. Um, I really, really like Delftware. First of all, that was imported in great numbers in the time period that I'm interested in here where I live. Uh, you know, from the early colonial period on till now, there was, it was a phenomenal amount of Delft imported into this area. So there's a lot of it around here in Massachusetts and New England. So there's that. But um, what I really like about it, it's this sort of a game of telephone that has been played over centuries from, like you said, Islamic pottery from, you know, the Arabian Peninsula through to Spain, to Italy, and then points beyond, as well as the Chinese export porcelain coming in at one point and, and really informing the aesthetic for a hundred years or so. And the whole thing, when it all mixes together, it's this, it's not just, I guess it's this conversation with this global audience with this global group of potters all over the place that are doing this thing in their own languages but they're all doing this thing that makes sense as one big long continuum and I I, I just I find that really fascinating and and really it's just appealing you know I don't know if that's exactly what you were looking for if that's what the question was about Sure. Yeah. Well, I think we all in that because I'm working in that ceramic continuum as well in terms of the the Silk Road going to the west and the and the Indian Ocean trade as well. Yeah. It's very hard to interrogate our own preferences and to figure out like why it is that that in in my case like why is it that I'm so enamored with English slipware even though sometimes it's the goofiest less refined version <laughs> when there are earlier iterations of the same continuum that are more refined, more skilled, more, more of everything. But I just love those goofy pots. Like I, I, I don't know why that's the thing that, that grabbed me the most, but it's such a rich, I mean, in terms of ceramic history, that, that period from 900 AD when China starts trading what we think of as porcelain, up until the 1700s like that it's a big chunk of time and it's a lot of geography that those pots travel but god you can it's just so rich like there's just so much going on it really is and it's a two-way street it's not just china comes in and everybody is trying to catch up with china but it was a conversation it was certainly a an amalgamation of a lot of different a lot of different influences uh, yeah you know i was just thinking something else I'd like to add about why Delft in particular <laughs> um, before college, and this is going to sound a little odd, but it works. Believe me. Uh, I took a few years off between high school and college and I pretty much hit the road uh, with the grateful dead. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> that was my life, you know, and you're speaking my language, by the way, I'm a huge dead fan. Oh gosh. You know, we would, I mean, somebody would have a house where we could silk screen T-shirts and bumper stickers and buttons, and then we'd go on the road and basically barter for, you know, tickets to a show, a place to crash for the night, a burrito or whatever. And really the late 70s, early 80s, when I was really into this, when I was doing this a lot, if you think about like, okay, so if you think about psychedelic music from San Francisco in the late 60s, you think of the late 60s, and it's like this blast of saturated you know day glow colors you know but when it came to the like the late 70s early 80s there's this whole different community of people that were this the aesthetic had evolved to a point where it was like depicting reality but reality that was tweaked in a little bit you know like real people real places real things that was just odd or just off and so that was kind of something i was terribly into and then later when i saw my first introduction to Delft, uh, there's a style of English Delft called uh, Wan Li style pottery, which is basically copied from a Dutch Delftware style called Wan Li that was basically copied from a Chinese export porcelain style called Wan Li, which was basically copied from a Chinese imperial porcelain style named <laughs> after 
this Emperor Wan Li from the Tang Dynasty. And this style featured incredibly stylized floral imagery, like they're flowers, they're plants, but nothing that exists in the real world. And they're basically landscapes with like a bug or a deer or whatever in it. But these landscapes with this floral imagery, sometimes it's floating in the air. Sometimes it's in the, you know, along the top of the frame. It's like what's up, what's down. And <laughs> so here I'm looking at this one Lee style and I thought, I get this, you know, I, it, this is, I used to do this, you know, and I thought this is a visual language. A, this is a historic visual language that I could see working with. It's kind of like you want you, if you like French poetry, for example, you learn the French language so you could read the French poetry. So it's kind of like that. I mean, I'm learning this language to express myself through that language. And it just matched perfectly with this thing that I had going on before. And that's, that was really one of the first breakthroughs in for my interest in Delft was thinking I understand this style. I, I can do this, you know? So that's kind of where that came from. That connection between psychedelia and the abstraction that comes from repetition as that, that cultural <laughs> telephone game. Yeah, that's what it is. Telephone, a game of telephone. Yeah. Yeah. I was not expecting you to say that, but I can see that because <laughs> I think about Chinese porcelain. My, my old boss, uh, Carolyn Chang has done a lot of research into porcelains and she she would show me these shards and she would say this is a bloom that was painted in the bottom of like a very simple rice bowl and then she would show me another shard that was 200 years later and it did not look it had the feeling of a blossom but it did not look like a blossom and she would talk about that through repetition abstraction is natural like the the relaxation of the pattern happens as people repeat over and over and over it's just a conversation through the years, you know, and I just, and like I say, I love a good story. And that's, that's a way to tell a story and to take part in a conversation. And you're right. It doesn't, you, you wouldn't even know that background looking at this stuff, you know, it's so, uh, somebody just looking for the first time at a Wan Lee picture, for example, but it's there, you know, and it's a great, it's a great method of telling a story and, and integrating history into your work. So when you think about selling to the modern audience, you know, you're making the redware work and then the Delft wear, do you find that a certain type of buyer goes for one versus the other? Well, it's funny. I mean, it's weird to have both. And I do struggle. Like sometimes I think I'm, I could just go all in with the, with the Delft wear and, and other times I think there are parts of the redware that I'm not done with that I love still working on. And I've got a whole following of people that are into redware that, I mean, frankly, I'm afraid to give up on. I, I, you know, you have to go where you can go with this stuff. Um, but I do notice that by and large, people will walk into a booth when we all used to do shows and go to one side and just look at the Delft or go to another side and just look at the redware. Personally, I, I am most interested in the people that look at everything and, and appreciate it all <laughs> the same, but it really is two very different audiences. And that's a, in general, it's a scary thing when a person, and I know other people do this, they are sick of what they're working on and they drop that and they start something whole new and you're just, you're taking on a whole new, you're abandoning a market strategy and you're taking on a whole new thing here. And it can be a scary thing, you know, but uh, it does work. And, and somehow I've managed to continue with it. I wanted to take a, a tangent into the chemistry of some of these glazes. The translucent glaze that's on the redware looks like lead, but I know it's not lead. <laughs> but can you, can you talk about how you get to a fluid transparent glaze at a low fire temperature well it's start i mean basically i when i left old sturbridge village i took their i took my experience from there and i took the recipe that they use the fritted glaze it's a very strange frit that's the basis of that glaze 30 3269 i believe it is um 
it's not a commonly used fret and it's a very expensive one and it tends to pinhole a lot. So there's problems with it. But um, uh, yeah, it, it, the trick is to try to make something coming out of an electric kiln that looks like it could have been fired in a solid fuel kiln or it looks like it has a patina of age or whatever. And those are the things that I'm trying for. And uh, so apart from glaze chemistry, when I, this, this glaze has a real tendency to, to craze. I think a lot of clear glazes do. It's slightly tinted, a little bit of iron in it, um, but it's pretty much a clear glaze over, over either a white slip or red clay. And it crazes and I can throw silica at it until it stops crazing, but I, it, at one point I, I realized there was some problem I needed to refire something. I reglazed it and refired it and the, the glaze seeped into the crackle and it came out with this crackly look that kind of like you can see on some old pots that had been used. And so I started using a second coat of glaze as sort of just a wash over the top of it. It doesn't work. I have two or three glazes. It only works on one of those, but that's how I get this crackly look. I, rather than fighting to cure it, I decided to work with it. And on that, on the scraffito and on the, a lot of the brownware, that's what you'll see. So you're actually glaze firing it and then dunking it in a very thin glaze and firing it again? Twice fire. Yeah, it started out as the same glaze, just really watered down. And after a while, you know, you run out of, you need to make a new batch. And I got kind of, you know, I'm running out of time. And so I just, by volume, it's just a stain. It's mostly, you know, just a bit of frit, a little bit of iron, a little bit of um, uh, bentonite to keep it, you know, and some Epsom salts to keep it from settling. And it's just, and it's done by volume, you know, two scoops of this, one scoop of that. So that's a stain, stainish glaze, very watery over the glaze. So it's really fired sometimes three times because some of this stuff I need to bisque. Some of it I don't. I just fire once. I'll glaze and fire it once. Some forms really need to be bisqued first just for handling or if it's super fragile or whatever. You're once firing the terracotta then, or some of it? Most of it, yeah. Most of it will be single fired. Well, it fired once and then I'll re, now, really it's fired twice. I fire it once glazed and then I'll dip it in this sort of liquidish glazy stainy mix and refire again. And, and again, like that's only, I have like three glazes and that's one of them that I do that with. There's one, uh, the formula really doesn't craze at all. And so that's a different beast altogether. And then there's the Deltware, which I don't do that too. The funny thing is about cra crackling though, is when I was in the Netherlands, I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've ever been to I'm the Netherlands or I highly recommend it if possible for anyone. Uh, I was at this tile factory um, in Harlingen, I think it was in the North of the country. And they were showing me around in the back and they said, you know, Americans that come here to buy our tiles, they really like, they like it to look old. They like it, our tiles to have this crackly look on them. And so, and their tiles are just these plain, you know, like white Delftware, Myolica with a painted design on it. So for the, for the American market, they'll put these tiles in a little oven, you know, the, the, the temperature of like a modern kitchen range heat it up to 500 degrees or so, and then throw it in a bucket of water to crackle the glaze <laughs> a little bit. And then they throw a wash on it and fire it again to get that same crackle. And I haven't, I, you know, and that's there. I have that in the back of my mind. I haven't gone that far yet <laughs> with the Delft, but it, it is, that's how you do that. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how international markets have dictated ceramics styles it's forever? <laughs> yeah. And the things you can learn, I mean, the other it's just great going there because I was struggling for years figuring out how to paint. How do, you, how do they do this? You know, and I'd look at videos online and it's like, this is how you paint in Maolica. And you would just, and somebody would just do something. And I'm thinking, but, but, but how much water is in that stain? You know, I mean, how, what kind of brush is it? You know, like there's a lot of questions. And in the Netherlands, their brushes, they have these big like Japanese style brushes. And they clip 
at the very tip, they clip off all of the bristles except just a few so that the stain, the bulk of the liquid mass is up in that bulk of bristles. And then just a little bit feeds down just like an old fashioned ink stylus pen down through that bristle. And that's how they get these nice clean lines and they can just paint forever with these things because it's like this this style of doing that, which just kind of blew me away. So it not just the market, but just the, the different ways that people do this sort of thing. And they also would have these big slabs of glazed, a big flat glazed slab, and they'd have a big mass of stain like watercolors, you know, and then they would just pour water on it. And then they could get a really saturated color where it's thicker or lighter color of that stain by adding more water over here. And so it's a very different, like using a palette for painting, which is not really how I do it, but it was really an eye opener to see the ways other people approach myolica and painting in general. It's really pretty cool. It makes me think of, I was in Jingdezhen and, and looking at the fake market. There's a whole like street oh of faked historical things. Well, they will swear like, no, this one is real. But if you go to the backside of the alley in that same street, <laughs> the guys will be sitting on the ground with little pieces of silicon carbide and they knock it against the pots in this rhythm. And I took this video of them basically aging these pots. And my, my wife speaks Mandarin. So she was asking like, do you mind us videotaping you? Cause basically this is your secret. And they just thought it was hilarious. They laughed. They thought it, you know, they didn't mind at all because the potters were very honest about the process. It was the fact that there were, they had salesmen that were telling a different story than the potters making the pots. <laughs> Isn't that what AY did a while ago was smashing that Han dynasty. There was a photo series of him breaking some Han dynasty pot and I think that's a statement on that sort of market where uh, for fakes and forgeries, you know, this there is being passed off as an original one. <laughs> and I think they grind up, they go to the point even where you can, I don't know about there where you were, but I've heard it said anyway, that you can grind up old pots and mix that in with the clay to make it really seem like it's an old, <laughs> old thing. And I'm thinking of in Germany during the Gothic revival of the late 1800s, they would use original Sieg, you know, molds from Westerwald and Siegberg and make pots in that style. I guess the main difference is they're not passing it off as originals. It's not a forgery or a fake. I mean, these are, you know, that's the key is you can do that and fine. It's a technique so long as you're being honest about what you're doing, you know. And I think salesmanship is just a part of this, you know, like people either passing them off as fake or not fake. It really, it doesn't matter if there's still that salesman doing the selling, you know, like I, I'm, I'm amazed I have my current podcast t-shirt is an etching of a, a German pottery salesman from the <laughs> 1800s. And what it is, is they were carrying pots around on their back and they were literally walking from town to town. And this would be like someone doing a Tupperware party, you know, like they were bringing you your jug and they would pull it off the back in their big backpack looking thing. And then they would sell it to you on the street. So it was this idea that the seller separate than the maker. And I, I, you know, it's not that different than gallerists today selling pots that in ceramic sculptures, they're not making. There's always been that breakdown of the maker and the seller. There's a delivery question there, but I, I've seen like uh, Parian figurines uh, in England and in France as well. They have these potter. They call they were called potters. You know, they'd put a big basket on their back and walk around the neighborhoods selling pots to people. It's a pretty crazy idea, but that's how it that's how it happened for a long time. I know. Can you imagine the the weight? Because like those jugs are not super light. Like they were like. Jug jugs, like heavy, heavy duty fragile stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, toll roads and then canals and railroads came in and, and the industrial revolution exploded. And, uh, it w and that's another time period that I find extremely fascinating. The industrial revolution, especially the early, the early time when it was really kind of this wild west of exploration where we could do anything, literally anything make anything out of clay and uh and the sales part was definitely part of it they can sell internationally they could sell anywhere because they have these networks 
uh, apart from just throwing it on a cart or a barge or walking around. And they were getting their materials from everywhere. This is where the beginnings of the commercial supply system this is where that that whole thing began and this is where all of you know because we're dealing in such volume we've got to understand clay and glaze theory and that's where that all began or really solidified anyway and a lot of the essential foundations of modern pottery whether you're a ceramic artist or a potter or whatever that that all really came to fruition at that time period. It's a phenomenally interesting time period where, where people stopped walking around and started selling catalogs of stuff to people on other continents. Really amazing. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your blogging. And, you know, this is something that started years ago, and I'm, I'm not sure how much you're writing these days. But when I read back, it's, I think it's, this day in pottery history. Yeah, this day in pottery history. The, it, it's been over, I don't know, it's been a long time, over 10 years longer. Uh, I came up with that name just because at the time there was a lot of this day in fill in the blank history kind of things going around. And I just thought that's what I, that's, that's the name, even though it's not a chronological on this specific day this thing happened. Well, I wanted to talk about how you benefited from the activity of putting your thoughts about history into writing. Because writing is so different than speaking. And your writing is very beautiful and dense. Like you get a lot of information and not that many paragraphs, which I really appreciate. Well, I appreciate the comments. I mean, terribly. And it's true. I talk like a a moron most of the time. But if you (laughs) give me enough time to like edit what I'm thinking, then I can come up with something anyway. With the blog, it's it's a tremendously good ex, uh, pr- exercise in learning how to write, first of all, because I decided at the very beginning that huge blocks of text nobody reads. I can't read huge blocks of text on a screen. And so I limited myself to 400 words per post because that's any longer than that and it's too much. And any shorter than that, I can't really get the whole story in, but it really forces you to look at repetition, look at words that just are weeds like this, the, than, you know, these words that don't need to be there and you just keep eliminating words and sentences until it no longer makes sense. And then you add one or two back and you've got something there. And that's a great way to organize your thoughts. And um, and so and and it really, like I said before about the village and the research library, that was kind of the basis of that whole thing. I had taken all sorts of notes and I had all this information and I wanted to do something with it. And this friend of mine, a fellow potter in the area here, Lucy Fagella, she she suggested blogging, and I thought, well, there you go. That's how I can present this stuff. And it doesn't really, I don't think it informs my work per se, but it, it it's like this continuing narrative that that goes along with it. It's like sort of the soundtrack, you know, you're sitting there listening to a soundtrack while you're working and I'm sitting there thinking about these stories as I'm making this stuff. And I find it to be a very, very nice compliment in that way. But mostly it's just, it's taught me a lot about writing and about expressing, learning how to express yourself as efficiently as possible. It's just like learning how to throw as efficiently as possible. A blog is a great way to do that. I don't know how many people read these things these days, but they certainly are a good exercise. Yeah, and I'm hoping they'll make a comeback, you know, like in the around 2000. 10 ish that era a lot of people in ceramics were blogging there was a lot yeah yeah and people were reading and i'm hoping that will come back because i i i had i wrote a blog before the podcast that was kind of the the project that started this before the podcast started going um but i i quickly realized that asking other people to write for my blog it was impossible because writing is work in the mind of a potter as to where talking is not work. <laughs> and that's why this is a podcast. <laughs> unless you're unless you're looking for outside hobbies for making pottery and the only thing you can come up with is writing about pottery. <laughs> 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 Which was my case, you know, I'm kind of doomed in that sense. But um <laughs> so much for outside interest. But 
it's it's just a whole new way, a whole other way of of synthesizing your experiences and your thoughts. And I don't know, it, it just works on its own level. I know there were a lot, a lot of people writing, and that's why I thought when I was looking at a lot of this, I some of them are two paragraphs long, and I thought I'd like to hear more about this. And some of them were like full pages, and I thought I can't, I can't do this, I can't read this. So if you just set parameters for yourself, I think you, I think you can really dig into something there. I wanted to wrap up going on a musical tangent because you you mentioned that you went on tour with the Dead for <laughs> <laughs> a long time, and I I got to hear about this. What what was the era? This was late seventies into eighties. Yeah, seventy eight, seventy nine to like eighty two, eighty three, more or less, right around that time period. It was it was a great time to be alive, Ben. It was just <laughs> it, it it was. And then I went straight from that into art school. So boy, oh boy, talk about, you know, young and barely responsible, you know, <laughs> it was a great time to be alive. And it, it, it taught me a lot about looking that experience of traveling around the United States and dealing with a lot of different people. It, it just opened up my mind to there was a whole lot more to be found and seen and understood than you could possibly get by not traveling in some way or another. And that's always been something that I've learned from. And, and that really, really helped. I mean, the music was just fun. It was just a blast. It was a lot of fun for sure, but it was really in ways that I didn't even understand at the time, a really deep education in appreciating, you know, uh, differences in people and in places. Yeah. I know this is a hard question for a music fan, but do you have a memorable show from that <laughs> 78 to show. 83? <laughs> well, I, I love them all. Um, <laughs> you know, the last one I'll tell you, there are plenty that are memorable. Oh my gosh. We could talk about this for hours, but the last one, the last, one of the last shows, I think I, I, I was at, ironically enough, the tour ended in Iowa City, Iowa, which is where I ended up going to school as a student. Um, and I, I went there, I saw this, and I knew I had already signed up to go to take classes there. And that was just a special, special time because I knew that I'm moving into something new here, and this is the end of an era and the beginning of a new one. And that really that has stuck with me. It, it, it really has. In fact, that, that's the whole reason I went to the University of Iowa was because I wanted to learn silk screening, you know, photo silk screening. I wanted to get really good at it. And, so, and they had a program there and I signed up and I, the tour ended there I was, and then they canceled the silk screening department, the program. <laughs> and I'm like, How, well, I want to mass produce. I want, you know, I want to do something in pottery. Someone suggested pottery and several years later, here we are, you know. I, I love the serendipity of, of all of this, the way that this is, has gone through your life. <laughs> Dumb luck. <laughs> I think I've talked about this on the show before, but my archiving skills started by archiving dead tapes back wow. when, when we did oh, that's cool. that's tapes. Great. That time you would send tapes in the mail and they would record as close to the first generation of the concert as they could get. And then they'd send you back the tape. And I had... I don't know, like three or 400 tapes. Like, Oh, I had boxes of tapes too. Yeah. Yeah. That was how I learned how to archive things. So then later, you know, when I came to podcasting it, the visual archive, that's the website, the way that I talk to people, the way I build the archive, like it's all based on grateful dead tape trading. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's lessons to be learned that you don't even know you're learning, you know, until years later. And so, <laughs> experiences they the way they play out it's just it's really it's a very good story it all makes for a very good story you know? <laughs> to wrap up can you leave your website so people can um, find out where to to get pots and also uh, social media websites it's stephen erp.com stephen with the ph the correct way of spelling stephen <laughs> s-t-e-p-h-e-n-e-a-r-p Facebook is Stephen Erp Redware. Um, Instagram is steve.erp.71. And I believe that's all there is for social media for me. Well, thanks, man. It was a pleasure to talk. I appreciate you taking the time.
Oh, no problem. Thanks for doing this, Ben. Your, your podcast is really phenomenal. I'd like to thank Stephen for doing this interview. I'm a big fan of his work and his approach to making, so I'm glad that we got to sit down and do the interview. Also wanted to thank today's sponsor, the 10th Annual Michiana Pottery Tour, happening September the 25th and 26th in northern Indiana and southern Michigan. You can find a list of participating potters as well as links to their web stores at michianapotterytour.com. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.